Hi, this is Phil Kerner, the Toll and Die Guy. And uh, for all you guys and gals who've been interested in mold making, you know, I've started and stopped this uh, program for years because it's just so hard to do. You know, I've got all these giant drawings down here in the studio. And luckily I have a, a guy in town that can scan really large drawings in, but they just don't compute right on the screen because uh, these are uh, 44 by 34 inch drawings. And uh, I've been trying to explain how injection molds work for many years here on YouTube. Well, I had an epiphany uh, about a week ago. It dawned on me that uh, 20 years ago when I had my own shop, I used to farm out all my design work to a guy in Erie and I called him up. I said, do you have any of my designs? 10 DVDs full of my designs. So what we're gonna do today uh, is go through a mold design, right from a product design, an overview of what goes into building an injection mold. And uh, you're gonna see a lot of, uh, I've got 15 sheets. Now, the way it used to work as a mold maker back in 2001, 20 years ago, they would give us a set of drawings, right? And uh, this is it, 15 drawings, a bill of materials. And the other thing was though, uh, we were far uh, enough advanced back then, the part prints were gone. Uh, our designer would model up the cavity and core and we would machine from that, all right, uh, from 3D models. Uh, electronic digital models, not the old duplicating models. Big change, right? So I've got all these drawings digitally and I was able to uh, put together a really cool lesson on this. So if you're interested, this is a long one. This is gonna be almost an hour, okay? So hang in there. Besides all the mold design stuff and an overview of everything, I've still got the personal notes from this mold, uh, what I quoted on it and uh, what uh, we got paid for it and how much money I made, all good stuff. So you're gonna get the, you're gonna get the real juice here uh, on this one. So I hope you enjoy this. This was a, uh, between uh, getting the files, getting an IGES reader, uh, a, a drawing reader. It's uh, it was a lot going into this. So uh, again, for you mold making wannabes, uh, this is uh, one that you'll enjoy. Now, for you guys who already are mold makers, just relax. I can't teach mold making in one video. This is an overview of 15 sheets of an injection mold, uh, but uh, it's a good start, I think. So I hope you enjoy this. Okay, let's start by looking at just a, a little sample of plastic parts that I happen to have here in the studio, all right? So let's uh, start with this simple box, all right? So let's clear everything else out of the way so we can concentrate. Doesn't get much simpler than this, okay? An injection mold for a little plastic box. As you can see, this is, says Lista. It's got a, uh, uh, actually uh, an engraving insert in the cavity or in the, uh, on the top of the core to uh, mark this as a Lista cabinet. Now you're all familiar with Lista cabinets. Uh, most of you probably have either a Lista or a Vidmar somewhere in your shop. And these are the little uh, plastic bins you put in each drawer, right? Well, this is a very uh, a simple injection mold, right? And uh, of course, nothing is ever as simple as it looks, but at least the geometry is simple. Now, uh, depending, on, depending on how many parts Lista wants made, right? So you wouldn't believe how many people walk into a mold shop, tool and die shop, and say, gee whiz, I just want a little mold built so I could stamp out, you know, a uh, thousand of these a year for my customers. And they get the estimate at $20,000 and they just can't believe it. Well, we're here today to talk about what goes into building even the simplest of plastic injection molds, all right? So there's a lot to talk about, but let's look at a few examples here. So that's the first one, as simple as it gets. Now, what I want to point out is what we have here is a flat parting line. And what do I mean by that? When the mold opens and shuts, it's flat, okay? The A and B plates, there's no curvature to them. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at another part. If we look at this part from a toy, if you look, you see this curve. Well, that means the whole a and B plate, when they meet, they have to shut off along this curve to form that curve of the part. All right, that adds a lot more work to the injection mold. Forget about this. This is all uh, EDM work, okay, and uh, uh, cavity and core work, but the parting line is the deal, and that is what adds a lot of expense to an injection mold. You're not going to learn everything about parting lines on this particular lesson, but there you see the difference. A curved parting line and a flat parting line. See the difference? 
All right. Now, a couple other examples I have here. I actually have all the digital drawings for this. A finger brush mold. And as you can see, uh, uh, I, it says Gojo on it. So we've all bought a bottle of uh, Gojo for the garage, right? And a lot of times this is clipped to the handle. And you put the Gojo all over and you scrub your fingernails, right? Well, you won't believe the work that went into making all these bristles. And in fact, I built this mold, a lot of it personally. And I'm the one that uh, stayed after work and ground all these uh, little slivers into inserts. It was quite a project, but we have a curved parting line. See that? Here and here. All right, so that's the way. There's your mold would open and shut here and here, but we've got a parting line, steel to steel, that's shaped like that. A lot more work. This is a good example, another example of an injection mold. This is a wheel hub for a toy. Picture a tire on this thing. Picture this being pressed onto an axle. Oh, uh, there's a lot going on here, believe it or not. What uh, makes this one extremely uh, more expensive is this lip right here. That won't come out of an injection mold. Let's picture this just like this in a mold. The plastic comes in, there's steel here. How's that gonna come out? It's going to come out because we have a slide coming in and out. All right. The mold is injected with plastic. The slides retract. The part can be ejected. If we didn't have a slide, this would tear right off. So I have all the uh, digital drawings for that. This will be a fun one to go through. Uh, but this was a pretty expensive mold here. It ended up being a 16 cavity uh, wheel hub mold. Now think about this. The toy company they needs four of these for each car they're building. So they're only getting four cars with a wheel hubs every time they open and shut the mold. But again, a lot going on with this one. And finally, I think the one we're going to start with is this. A simple toy gas nozzle. For I think this is like for the little tanks company. The kids could pull up and fill up their little tanks cars with fake gas, right? But this is the fun part. Do you ever look at a plastic part and you're trying to get it up and, and something happens to it and you just can't you'd say, oh, a switch or something broke inside. No, not on this one, but you can't get it apart. Well, there's a reason for that. And this one comes apart because it was never sonic welded. Now, if we look here, we have two separate parts. And you see these pins here, these plastic pins, plastic, if you want to call them uh, uh, lugs, they're going to locate inside these holes, all right, to help this thing fit together. Now, it's hard to do on camera. Let me just... Uh, back off a minute so my eyes match what I'm seeing here. All right, back together we go. But what you don't see here also are these big bosses here and uh, here, here, and here. They go into these um, holes here and they get sonic welded together. And what do I mean by that? Well, in the sonic welding process, once these parts come out of the injection mold, they put them together like that, and a horn, they call, it's just a piece of metal or whatever they use comes down, I'll figure that out, but a, a piece of material comes down and puts a sonic vibration through this part and glues this part together, literally wells these two parts together. That's why when you see two parts and you know they're two parts, you can't get them apart, and you think, did they super glue these? No, they sonic welded them together. And again, it's a, it's a very simple process. It's an expensive process. And most uh, plastic shops have a sonic welding uh, unit or several. And uh, again, an operator will just set this in, place both parts together, and that thing will come down, just touch it, and put this high vibration ultrasound through it, and these parts will be glued together. But there's a little bit more to it than that, and we'll see uh, in the upcoming videos I show you on this mold what makes a sonic weld bead work. So that's the first introduction to uh, some parting lines, um, some undercuts, uh, some sonic welding, and some heavy duty inserting to get this done. So uh, that's uh, just a little overview of where we're going here. All right, now, now that we've spent some time and looked at a handful of sample injected, uh, injection molded parts, uh, let's look at the elements of an injection mold. Well, it all starts 
uh, number one, element number one, with a part, right? Uh, somebody comes up with an idea, a company needs a new part, uh, an inventor comes up with something, and they decide it needs to be made out of plastic. So it always starts with a part design. The second element is the material type. There are um, a lot of different types of plastics, all right? So some are more abrasive than others. So that does affect the um, way the uh, engineering of the mold design will go. Uh, some material is abrasive, so maybe perhaps the mold will have to be hardened or chrome plated, and some is less abrasive. But material type uh, does uh, factor in to the mold design. Element number three, the number of cavities required. And that's just how many parts are going to fall out of the mold every time it opens and closes, all right? And it depends on how many of these parts do you need a year. Do you need 500 a year or 5 million a year? And again, that factors into how many cavities you need and uh, the cost of the mold. So that's another uh, big consideration into uh, in, an injection mold and injection mold design. Number four, element number four is a big one, the parting line. And as I discussed in that previous uh, video, is it a flat parting line or is it a, a contoured parting line? A contoured parting line takes much more time to machine and to uh, fit up at the final assembly. Element number five, side actions. And what do I mean by that? Well, does this mold, as I showed you on that uh, yellow part, the hub, um, does it have an undercut or a side window that needs to be cored out uh, and uh, once the steel meets uh, on the side it needs to be retracted somehow from the side or when the parts ejected it'll just rip the part all right so side actions or undercuts that won't let the part eject normally that adds cost element number six the precision required um you know if you're building a toy mold like i showed you with uh, a gas nozzle mold uh, or are you building uh, parts for uh, NASA? All right. Uh, this that depends a lot upon the precision required, and that will uh, factor into the design and to the uh, actual tool making also. Uh, if we're holding uh, parts within uh, millions versus uh, a couple thousands, big difference. Element number seven: injection. How are we going to get that plastic in the mold? Well, we've got a lot of options there: uh, tab gates, tunnel gates, direct. Uh, um, sprue, uh, hot runners, there's so many different ways to inject plastic into the mold, uh, but that depends on how many parts the customer wants and what uh, that customer is willing to spend. But injection is a huge part. Element number eight, ejection. How are we going to get the part out of the mold? You know, uh, round parts, sometimes we use a thing called a stripper ring. Uh, on a multi-cavity mold, we might use something called uh, a stripper plate. Uh, for your average injection mold, usually ejector pins will be just fine, but that factors in also. Number nine, cooling. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, drilling into the cavities and the cores to get water to cycle through both of them to cool the mold so that the part will set. The more cooling you have, the faster the cycle, right? And how far do you want to go with that? You know, there's different materials you can use in an injection mold that are very expensive, but will make that part cool much faster. And again, if you're trying to make millions of these things a week, and there, there are molds that do that, they spend the money to do it. Uh, but your average injection mold, uh, we're just going to drill a lot of uh, water lines to cool it, but there's definitely options. And finally, number 10, the press size. What size press is this mold going to be running? Well, that does factor into it, all right, because... Um, Every press size, from a 50-ton press to a 1,000-ton press, has an hour, hourly rate, all right? Running parts in a small press is much cheaper than running parts in a very large press. Much in the same way in the tool and die business, the shops that could do the biggest work could charge the most for it. Of course, because the molds are bigger and more expensive, but they, you're limiting the uh, competition also. There's only a handful of people who can run really, really, really uh, large injection molds or build them. So uh, most people try to uh, keep the uh, mold size down so it'll fit in a, a more economical press size. That factors in. So that being said, we started off with the part. And uh, the part we're going to start off with today is the uh, gas nozzle. Okay, And uh, I have the full detail of the drawing we're going to go through here, about 15 sheets. 
to give you guys an overview of how the, this process works. But let's start right from the very beginning here. Here we go. We've got uh, two plastic parts that have to be engineered to fit into this mold base and in the end have to fit in this injection molding machine. So it all factors in. You just don't design a mold and say, oh, I'll just guess at the size and uh, hope it fits in the right press. Everybody needs to work together because sometimes if that mold is just a hair too big, it won't fit in the right size press that the customer was counting on. So everybody has to work together in this process, all right? So with that being said, uh, that's your overview. And uh, let's go into uh, this uh, particular mold here for the gas nozzle. And this will give you a nice insight of to what it was like, uh, or still is like, to build an injection mold for a plastic part. Okay, so we start with a part, as I mentioned in the uh, first section of this lesson. And uh, back in the old days, we used to get a part drawing, all right? But that's uh, pre-1995. Uh, by this time, the customer would send us uh, what is called a, a surface model or an IGES file, 3D model. So let's take a look at this. This is uh, one half of the nozzle mold, or the nozzle part. Here's the other half, all right? So these two parts are going to fit together, but what we'll really see is when we start looking around the uh, back side. Now we're starting to see the bosses. We've got a gusset rib here to strengthen this, but these are the bosses on this side. And if we go to, uh, let's move this over a little bit. There you go. And if we go to this part and we uh, turn that over, this is the other half the bosses are going to telescope into. And if you look closely here, this is formed by a core pin which we would have to EDM these, uh, you'll see that on the prints for the mold, uh, these slots into the pin, and this will be a sonic weld bead. And you'll see them down here, down here, down here, three sonic weld beads, nope, the fourth one. So that's what will keep these two parts together. Now if we look at the other side, the other part, these are the telescoping uh, bosses that will fit in. Now let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this so we're uh, seeing what we've got going on here. So now you can see those bosses. See that? And those are where you're going to telescope into these bosses. Okay, let's. Uh, Obviously, these uh, two very small ones will telescope into these bosses right here. All right? So this is the way they're going to hold this part together and glue it together. Uh, it's like that. If you want to uh, take a, a little bit better look at this thing, some of the detail. I um, can't remember how much of this we actually machined or had an EDM. This gets a little fine down in here, okay? Uh, for the cavity side. So that's a quick look at the two parts that are going to be uh, molded from this mold and then uh, sonic welded together. Hope that makes a little more sense to you. All right, so let's take a look at uh, sheet number one. What do we know here? Uh, the material, ABS Valtra, six thousandths shrink per inch. Uh, we've discussed that before, but just uh, to rehash re uh, that, you just need to make sure that the mold is... Um, built six thousandths per inch bigger than the parts could uh, be. So when the mold the part comes out, it shrinks and cools off, it ends up the right size, all right? So every dimension on this mold is uh, six thousandths per inch bigger than the actual model we received. So this is the main assembly, sheet number one. This is a section view for the tool maker, uh, cut across the, the lengthwise of the mold, and we've got a bill of material over here. Uh, Cavity plate, core plate, injector retainer plate, all the good stuff that goes into um, an injection mold. They don't pay a lot of attention in this particular drawing to any cavity details. They're just showing it in place, the wall stock there for the part. Uh, just to give you an idea, but those that's the stuff that will be on the other uh, drawings to follow. This is an assembly print. 
again to give the tool maker a little bit of an idea of what's going on here uh, we've got a, a little bit uh, this mold is built in the solid as we would call it uh, there are no inserts for the cavities in the cores it's cut solid into a and b plates made of p20 uh, the a plate the front half uh, is uh, p20 and so is the b plate or the back half of the mold uh, we've got some ejector pins or let's see we've got um, core pins coming up through to core out those bosses you can see the uh, wall stock here and we've got the injector sleeves that surround the core pins to push the parts off of those bosses, off these core pins. Um, we've got a, a, um, a rather large boss here, again with the injector sleeve here. Here's the core pin coming up through to core out that, that uh, boss. And then we've got an injector sleeve to push it off. And uh, a lot, a lot of um, injector sleeves on this particular mold. We've also got just plain uh, ejector pins right here just to push this boss off. You can see that. Um, and again, more sleeves. We've got a core pin retainer plate to, to keep the cores in place. Uh, I believe we've got some water lines in this back uh, clamping plate to keep uh, these core pins cool. I'm going to guess that's what that is, but more shall be revealed. Uh, we've got a return pin here when the mold closes to push this ejector system back. Uh, what we're seeing here in this area is the guided ejection system that ensures that the ejector system is going back and forth straight a lot less wear on the uh, pins to do that uh, it's worth doing and then now uh, we've got some stop pins here and that uh, whole ejector system come, comes down and stops on these um, buttons we call them stop buttons all standard issue stuff in the mold industry um, what do we have here uh, these are holes for the knockouts for the press They'll screw rods into here into half 13 holes, and that's what's going to stroke these ejector plates back and forth. Here's another one here, but again, this view doesn't show everything. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, we've got a leader pin here, a bushing here. There'll be four of those, but this is your uh, first uh, view. This is sheet number one. All right, moving to sheet number two. Uh, this is another main assembly. We see that. Um, same deal, uh, nothing's going to change with the shrink rate, the gas nozzle mold. Uh, we never did talk about a date. June 4th, 2001, coming up on 20 years ago. All right, so this is a section view cut through the width of the mold. The last section view is through the um, length of the mold. <clears throat> this is the width. So what do we learn from this section? We've got some basic things. Now you can see the rails for the ejector box right here and here. We've got a bolt holding those together. A couple dowel pins you'll see in some other views. Uh, this is a support column, a support column. Uh, those are usually a couple inches in diameter to support this B plate with this big gap in here between the rails and the ejector system. And just different bolts and dowels for the assembly. Uh, a couple things of note here. We can see the uh, uh, rails have been notched out to make room for a clamp here. Uh, these are clamp slots for the back half of the mold. They'll just put uh, clamps on here to clamp it to the molding press. And these are clamp slots machined in to the A plate, uh, again, for the same purpose, to clamp the mold to the press. What we have up here is a, uh, usually a store-bought item. Right here is the locating ring. And the locating ring is actually used to locate and center the entire uh, mold into the injection molding press. Uh, we have a sprue bushing here. This is where the plastic will be injected into the mold and into the runner system. This is, again, usually a store-bought item. You'll see they have a half-inch radius here. And uh, some presses have a three-quarter radius. Some have a, uh, depends on the press size, or a half-inch radius. This particular one, I believe, is a half-inch. We'll see that on a detail in a little bit. But this is where the nozzle from the press is going to come in and shut off, seal against that, and then inject the plastic into the mold. So a couple other things. We've got some parting line locks here to keep the parting lines from shifting. And uh, lastly, we've got some stack heights. And those are fairly important. Uh, Believe me, uh, you're never going to put these in a press that this is that important, that if you're uh, uh, a quarter of an inch off of this whole thing, it's going to matter. But the, the uh, molder does need to kind of have an idea of what the, the overall stack height is. So, you know, these rails, we would usually buy three and a half inch coal roll. By the time they're ground, they might be three inches, 485, okay? And the same with these plates that are blanched or grind. But this, as you'll see, becomes important for the final assembly to calculate some lengths of the sprue bushing and the pins, uh, things like that. So these are the nominal dimensions of what we're looking for, an overall view of the, uh, um, the mold stack height. And you're also seeing here the ejector plate here is an inch and an eighth. Uh, the ejector retainer plate that retains the ejector pins is a five eighths. And this is the stroke. This is as far as that ejector plate can move, all right? 
the taller and thicker or higher the part is, the more stroke you need because you've got to push the part off further. This part, as you can see, is just not that thick, so an inch and a half or an inch and nine sixteenths of stroke will be fine. Uh, but that's a quick view, that's an overview of um, sheet number two. All right, now we're moving into sheet number three. It says main assembly again, but this is actually, uh, I believe, this is the A plate, the front half of the mold. This is the side of the mold. That this is the cavitation. These are the cavities that are cut into the uh, into the actual uh, A plate to form the part. We've got a runner system here, and you can see this is where the um, let's make sure we're centered here. This is where the plastic is going to come in and be uh, branching off on these runners down to here, okay, over here, and then into these gates. And we'll see more details on the gates as we move forward, okay? Now, let's take a look at a few things here. First of all, you'll see all these dotted lines here. And those are the, the water line system, all right? And for you guys who are wondering what apprentices sometimes learn to do in a tool shop, well, this is one of the things, uh, laying out and drilling water lines. You gotta be very careful with water lines because you don't wanna miss a dimension and run into the cavitation. That's a nightmare. Uh, so, uh, and you can imagine drilling lines a, a foot deep, um, sometimes much longer. Um, you, know how to, you have to know how to sharpen your drills and things like that. So it's a good place to start sometimes. You can see the dotted line here uh, for the um, locating ring for the press. It's usually about four inches in diameter. And again, we'll see that more on some uh, detailed prints. Again, this is a, an overview. Again, uh, the front half plan view, A plate. What we have here, though, uh, are parting line locks. Now, these are the leader pins that will go into bushings to guide the whole mold together. But there is a little clearance involved because these are moving parts. So if you really want your part to have a really accurate parting line and the mold not to shift under molding uh, injection pressure, um, we put these parting line locks in and they're dead straight. Um, and that will definitely keep the mold from shifting one way or the other once the mold is closed, all right? Uh, a few other things of note, uh, you can see that, that this guy is marked the top of the mold and this is the operator side. That's got a lot more to do with how it's hung in the press, all right? You can see these dotted lines over here, eye bolt hole, eye bolt hole, eye bolt hole, and eye bolt hole, all for lifting purposes, all right? And uh, what was the last thing? Oh, this is finally a little view to give us some, uh, we saw the overall stack heights on the last drawing, and this is the length and width of the mold. This mold is 13 and 3 eighths by 20 and 3 quarters. Standard mold base size, uh, if we look in the catalog, uh, we could probably look that up. So that is uh, an overview of the A-plate sheet number three. All right, let's look at sheet number four. Again, another main assembly, uh, rear plan view. That's a good name for it, or the back half or the B-plate, all right? Interchangeable. A couple things uh, of note here. Now you're going to see a lot more detail here. Uh, these are the bushings for the, uh, for the um, leader pins to guide the whole entire uh, mold together. I believe you'll see later in this uh, another view that this pocket here is for a cycle counter. And it's a very simple mechanism. Every time this mold opens and shuts, it'll count the cycle. Okay, sometimes that's important to the guy who paid for it. He wants to know how many cycles he got out of it before uh, he gets a repair bill. Okay, good question, good uh, thing to know. All right, so uh, again, these are our parting line locks. We discussed those on the last drawing. And now we're starting to see some detail here. The back half is very busy. That's where all, all these bosses are uh, machined into. All these core pins are coming in. This is the guided ejection, guided ejection, guided ejection, guided ejection. These bigger holes or these bigger things here are, are support pillars. And the inside diameter is the, part, the support pillar itself, and the outside diameter is the clearance. Usually an eighth inch. Those don't need to be anywhere close. So we've got a number of support pillars here. And you notice they're all located pretty much near where the part's going to be molded, right? So one, two, three, four, five, looks like six support pillars. Again, the guide the ejection and uh, return pins. One, two, three, four. That's to uh, push the ejector plates back when the mold shuts. And uh, again, these are all the ejector pins and bosses that you can start to see on this particular view. All right, so very busy plate. Look at all the water lines that are going to be drilled on this one. No dimensions again. This is still a main assembly view uh, to give the uh, toolmaker uh, still a, 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 an idea of what his project looks like. So that's a, a recap of sheet number four. 
All right, so this is uh, sheet number five. And all this is is an isometric view for the mole banker. Uh, nice view for him. Now, I, I had some good difficulties finding this one, and I did not take the time to change all the text and lines back to uh, 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 white in this particular case, but that's fine. We can still see what's going on here. Well, this is a good view for the tool maker, right? This gives him a nice ISO view, isometric view, of what his final product is going to look like on the bench. So, again, we have the front half of the mold here, the A plate. We can see all the vents cut in here, all right? And then we can see the leader pins. The leader pins will slide into these bushings. Two, three, four. One of them is always labeled a zero corner and it's slightly offset uh, because they don't want you to be able to turn the mold 180 degrees and put it together, all right? Here's a good view of these parting line locks. Now you can see they're dead straight. They're hardened and they'll fit into these parting line locks over here. This is the male side, female side. What also we can see here is a nice view of the ejector box. This is what will stroke back and forth to uh, eject the part. You can see that we've got our rails here. We can't see the support pillars underneath there, but this is the ejector box. It will stroke back and forward here. Uh, we've got a core pin retainer plate for all the core pins, and then a rear clamp plate. And again, that one's cut right straight through, and uh, that's how they'll clamp that half into the, mold, the molding press. And on this particular uh, side, the A plate, we've just cut a slot in here. All right, so that is just an ISO view. We can see the runners and the gating here. Um, this is the cavity, of course, and the core. And uh, this is the ejector side. This is where the part's going to want to stick to, and that's why it's got an ejector system. And of course, we can see the sprue bushing coming in here to feed the runners. All right, so that's just a nice view. You can see uh, I'm not seeing a lot of uh, eye bolt holes here. I can see one there. But uh, I'm going to say these are water lines. It's probably an eyeball hole, eyeball hole right on center line. This isn't meant as a machining drawing. This is just a pictorial view for the mold maker to kind of get an overview of what this should look like when it's done and on his bench. Moving forward to sheet number six. Uh, what this is the cavity plate, the A plate, or the front half. All right. So what do we have here? Well, we finally got some dimensions here. And uh, again, this is much more for the guy building the mold base, drilling the water lines, all right? Because what I loved about this designer, of course, is he always gave us a nice little 3D view, ISO view of the plate down here, just so that who's ever working on this plate gets kind of an idea of what this is going to look like. Well, we learn a few things from this ISO view. We can finally see a nice view of these um, pockets that are cut for the locks, all right? And they'll just be screwed in, I think, with some either quarter 20s or some 5 16 18 screws. But the cavitation, you'll notice there's just not a lot of dimensions on the cavities. Well, there's a reason for that, because by uh, the time this drawing was done, uh, this would have all been done via CNC, all right? So there's no mold maker over there in a bridge port doing all this work, all right? Now, before CNC, we would have had a duplicating model, and we would have traced that out of an epoxy or a mahogany model, right, right into the cavity. So what do we know from this drawing? Well, again, we've got our cavities here, and finally we're seeing a good view of our runner system here. Okay, and it's a uh, 3 16th uh, radius, which is a 3 8 runner, and uh, got a, we're going to bore a one inch hole in there for our sprue bushing, and uh, a two inch hole here for the sprue bushing head. Nice big champ, pretty clear of the radius on the sprue bushing, and. Uh, the 3 inch 990, um, that was probably supposed to be machined at 4 inches. I believe the sprue bushing or the locating ring itself is four in, um, 3 inches 990, and that they give you about 10 thousandths clearance on that. Uh, that's the two screws to screw the locating ring in. And I'm going to do a whole video on mold components, so relax. There's a lot of mold components. But uh, let's see here. We've got our clamp slot here, and there's one on the opposite side. If we look, all right. Now he's dimensioning the counter bores for the water line fittings there, but here's your clamp slot. And of course, everything's out to four places. Believe me, you don't want to machine your clamp slots to four places. That's plus or minus 20. That should just be a fractional dimension, seven eighths, and uh, same with the depth, uh, five eighths. Nothing there is critical. They're just going to put a, 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 a clamp on that to hold it into the press. All right. We've got our uh, leader pins here, the holes and uh, he's to mention that. So this is much more of a print for the guy that's building the mold base, all right? Uh, he's gonna um, put these holes in here in four places, uh, one inch press fit for the leader pins. He's got uh, some eyeball holes over here. He's showing the uh, at zero, the overall thickness of the block is two and seven eighths. And uh, 
a lot of water lines, okay? And then of course all of these vents, which could be two place dimensions also. But that's okay. We would uh, just dial over and mill those in, 10 thousandths deep here, 1 thousandths deep there, all right? And that's what gets the gases out of the mold. And uh, finally, a nice thing to finally see here is a little uh, detail here that's very important. The um, way that the plastic is going to get put into the part. And we're missing a few lines here. Sometimes when you bring these files in, things don't interpret perfectly, but we're glad just to have these files, all right? Uh, if I'm going to say if we carry these lines out, this would be a 20 degree um, cutter that you would put in there, or an electrode at a 45 degree angle to cut this uh, gate in here. And this is called a tunnel gate because it looks like a tunnel going into the part. And this is quite enlarged here, all right? But the uh, uh, the actual diameter, I believe, of this would have been uh, a sixteenth of an inch. And the way that's set up is it's so small that the, it'll shear off when the pull-up part is ejected, all right? That's the game plan anyways. Um, but that's your gate. Now, how do you machine those? Well, you could either put this whole block up on a bridge port and tip the head at uh, 45 degrees. We've done that, believe me. Or uh, if you have a CNC EDM machine, you can easily do that in these days. But back then, put a lot of big blocks on uh, mills, and if you did the block was so big and they wanted to tunnel gates into it, you'd have to uh, uh, insert that area, all right? Uh, put some sub inserts, I guess we call it. Now, one more thing to point out here. This is cut into the solid, as I said before. Sometimes we cut pockets into these uh, mold bases, and each one of these might be a separate insert. In this case, this is one giant piece of P20 material that we're going to machine all this work into, all right? And P20 is a little tough. Uh, it's a pre-hardened. That's what the P stands for. It's got some nickel in it uh, for polishability and some chrome, uh, but it's a uh, about 35 Rockwell. It's not cold roll or hot roll. It's uh, but it's a nice steel for mold building for uh, when you're not going to run billions of parts. All right. So it's a pre-hardened steel, and uh, that is an overview of um, the cavity plate, the A plate. The all right. Let's take a look at sheet number seven, the core plate, the B plate, the back half. Again, uh, here's your little ISO here. This is uh, totally cut into the solid once again. We've got our pockets here for our store-bought parting line locks. We've got our holes here for our bushings. We've got our holes here for our return pins. And uh, what was the other thing I was going to show you? Well, just our runners, gates, whatever. Uh, the runner stops here, and it stops there on the same thing on the B plate or the A plate. But the uh, gate itself always goes into the cavity most times. All right. So uh, that's a little 3D view. Now what have you got going on here? Well, this is a pretty busy plate if we step back for a second, right? Um, this would be the dimensions for the, the bushing, a headed bushing for the leader pins. Uh, a lot of details going on over here. All these bosses. Uh, 304 BOD, beginning of draft. And that would be down at the bottom. Sometimes you can label that in the mold design as 0.304 diameter um, plus uh, two degrees PS per side. But that's the way he chose to do it, all right? So you can see this fine detail that's being machined down here that would have all been EDM'd into the uh, core plate. Eyeball hole here. But uh, what we're looking for here is uh, all these water line dimensions. Okay, and this, that's a pipe plug there. So. We're not going to spend the time here right now to figure out this water line system, but see this big hole here? That's for a fitting, like an airline fitting, if you've ever used an air hose. Well, we left a nipple sticking out there. They could quickly couple a water line on there. And if we follow this through, it looks like it went here, here. Ooh, not sure what's going on. Which way is it going? Back up to here back up to here and it's plugged there so it's got to go back up to here plug there got to go back out all right so that's the in and out so there's four probably four systems here for each core to uh, get the water in and out of the mold uh, that's our little uh, pocket for our cycle counter and again more bosses to be machined in how do we do those well uh, standard uh, um, uh, two degree cutter would probably go in there 
uh, 375, we might plunge it in. It might have a two degree cutter with a two degree uh, 375 tip on it. Might circle mill that. Certainly if it's a normal angle like that, back in the day we used a lot of tapered end mills, all right? Just plunge those in or circle mill them. But that is a, a really beautiful look at your uh, A plate front half, okay? So again, built into the solid. Moving on to sheet number eight. All right, starting with sheet number eight here, the ejector retainer plate. This is what's going to hold the ejector pins in place, and you can see all these little counter bores in here on the ejector plate. This is where the, the heads of the pins will fit in, all right? And if you look, a little chamfer there. Every ejector pin has a little radius on it, and it's very important to chamfer those. Back in the day, they actually made ejector pin counter bores. They were a little counter bore for each size, and they had a chamfer tool right on it to cut that in. Now, of course, you could take a hand drill and just put a chamfer on it. All right, so basically what we've got here, um, you can see, let's look at the little 3D ISO view here. It's uh, a lot of holes, right? Uh, these would be the guided ejection system holes. Uh, these are the knockouts to connect to the mold press. And uh, as I said before, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 10. I think I said... I don't know what I said before. There's 10 uh, support pillar holes in there. Big uh, clearance deal there. Um, these are the return pins here. Uh, yep. Moving along here, how thick is this plate? 5 eighths, no big deal here. Uh, again, this is kind of uh, beginner CNC work. Just a simple plate uh, with a lot of big clearance holes in it. A few things do matter, you know, the uh, uh, guided ejection hole here let's see here do they have that better dimension than that nope he's just giving all the uh different uh pin diameters but uh that one inch 130 yeah that would be, that that bushing would probably be an inch and an eighth so it doesn't have to be that close of a tolerance and of course the bushing has a um head on it and again that should show up somewhere in this drawing but I don't see it the guy the ejection system it might be in the injector plate itself which we'll get to in a minute so again this is a um, basic mold base work great way to start a kid in the trade uh, this plate is not that critical the locations are fairly critical but uh, um, uh, the biggest problem with these plates is when you put all these holes in it they tend to warp a little bit but once they get clamped down and bolted together they tend to straighten out all right so that is a review of sheet number eight. All right, let's start with sheet number nine, the ejector plate. And, uh, you know, you're kind of watching this with me. Uh, I've looked at these a few times, but now I told you about the guy, the ejection, uh, inch and an eighth, that's what they want a nice fit into, okay? On the other plate that bolts on top of this one, the ejector retainer plate, the last one we looked at, um, they just cleared that bushing. It doesn't need to be that tight. You don't want to fight both plates together over a bushing. So that's the actual diameter for the ejector, uh, guided ejection bushing. Uh, this plate's much thicker, but the big thing we should look at here, of course, we've got the clearance holes for the supports, um, the guided ejection system, but uh, there should be some knockout holes. And that's a big deal. Very few uh, training videos talk about the knockout holes. See that? One, two three, four. They're eight inches and eight inches apart. Sixteen inch by what? Uh, where is it? Two. So it's four. Sixteen by four knockout pattern, but some presses, uh, they did, I want another one, three and a half by three and a half. Again, what they'll do with these holes is connect stakes to them. We call them stakes. They're just rods with, with threaded uh, ends on them to put, uh, to connect the mold uh, molding press to the ejector plate and that's what will stroke the plate back and forth we've talked about ejection that's what makes it work is are these tapped holes these half 13s are the are the thing that makes the whole system go back and forth because it ties into the molding press all right that's a really important point here about uh, mold design you kind of need to know uh, what system what press this is going to go into because every press has a few options with their knockout system, all right? And I did a little research online on this. Unfortunately, I guess like the way it goes now, 
all the presses uh, knockout patterns I could find were uh, metric and because most of the presses now I think are built in China okay so big shock there but uh, back in the day these were standard uh, knockout patterns and they would tell you just give us a 16 by 4 that so we knew that meant 8 inches off center each way and 2 inches off center each way and then a three and a half inch on center this way and this way again no big deal but that's that's what that was just a, a place to connect the ejector rods from the molding press into uh, the, the ejection system on the actual mold. All right, so that concludes uh, our review of sheet number nine. All right, so next up is the sheet number 10, the rails. Talk about uh, beginner's work, okay, but they're important. Um, basically, these are usually made out of cold roll, and we can look at the bill of materials later to see what that's true, but uh, normally they're nominal numbers. Uh, this is an inch and seven eighths uh, wide by uh, three and a half inches tall okay and the length is the length of the mold base 20 and three quarters all right so all the rails do is as you saw kind of tie into the whole ejector box all right uh, this is the system these these rails are the thing that gives the space for the ejector system to have some room to move all right so you can see just a 3d view here and what we've got here is uh, a couple different things we've got um, some dowel pins here to locate them into the rear clamp plate uh, and some bolt holes to tie them to the rear clamp plate and what you have here is something called a tubular dowel and a tubular dowel is just what it is it looks like a dowel pin except it's got a hole in the middle to clear this bolt you have two choices with the rails you always want to lock them in place with some sort of a dowel you can either drill and ream a dowel pin three and a half inches through sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't uh, it's a long way to keep a dowel pin straight but uh, especially back in the day when we did this on a drill press. But a quick way is to use the same bolt hole and put a tubular dowel pin here. And that'll locate it. At the the uh, back of the B plate will have the same diameter in it. And it just looks like a little bushing that goes in here. And that'll lock these rails into the uh, back half of the mold. So everything lines up beautifully, all right? So again, uh, the three and a half is a nominal dimension. Again, we would normally buy three and a half inch cold roll bars and uh, grind them to make sure they're nice and flat. So you usually end up with, you know, five on the side you're going to take off and cold roll is always a little undersized. So let's call that three inches, 997 to start. Minus 10 thousandths, three inches, 987. So three inches, 985, as I said in a previous video, would be right. Not a critical dimension. They just need to be flat and parallel. Parallel is a big deal with these rails. That's about it. All right. So uh, again, a beginner, uh, CNC work or apprentice work that's a lot of us did that when we started so um, again that is sheet number 10. Sheet number 11 the core pin retainer plate and again uh, as you know this particular mold has a lot of core pins in it to core out the bosses that are going to put these two plastic parts together all right again this would be a nice job for a beginner on the uh, CNC machine just a lot of uh, drilled holes right we've got some eyeball holes on the ends to lift and handle the plate this plate is again 20 and 3 quarter by 12 and an eighth because it's got to fit in between the rails so it's a little narrower than the mold base there's a little 3d view of it here okay and just a lot of holes to hold all these core pins in place and he's got all of them dimensioned and again if you look closely you got a little champ for there to clear the radius on the core pin but uh not a lot going on here simple simple plate to build uh, how thick was this one gotta have it on here somewhere he doesn't hmm. we'll have to look at the bill of materials to see how thick this one was dave if you're watching this i'm very disappointed i'm tweaking at work 20 years later so uh again uh blanchard ground plate that'll just uh, maintain all the core pins and all you're seeing here is these it says ko these are the knockout holes as we discussed before for the molding press again they should be i believe eight inches yeah okay so uh eight 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 and what's the should we say two 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 on the y and then we've got a couple here three and a half three and a half to tie the uh, that's just clearance to tie the um ejector system in again again uh, not a big deal here but that's another plate in this uh mold construction and uh, that is sheet 11 so let's go move on to sheet 12. all right moving on to sheet number 12 the rear clamp plate all right 
again this would be I uh, probably didn't cover the plates more this would probably just be a uh, 4140 material okay kind of tough but uh, again back to the clearance holes for the knockouts for the press but you'll see something interesting here um, again it's called the rear clamp plate because it goes on the very back of the mold and this is what they're going to clamp into the press all right it just holds the whole back half of the mold together this is the final thing when you're assembling that goes into it um, an interesting note here we've got some uh, got some water lines here all these are are bolts to hold the plates together okay and that's not a big deal to socket and cap screws and this one in particular is 7 8 thick okay just a blanchard ground plate but we've got some water lines going through this and why would we have water lines going through a, a plate this far back into the process well I will look at the bill of materials but I'm going to guarantee you this lines up with some of those big core pins that are going up into the mold to um, form some big bosses and what they want to do is run some coolant underneath the heads of those to cool those pins down the bigger the mass sometimes of plastic you're trying to core out uh, the less time it, the more time it takes to set so by simply running some uh, water lines underneath the coring system, the core pins, the largest ones, that should help cool those pins off. And again, we can do much more in depth on this mold design, uh, but that is what that is. Those are definitely water lines. They're a 7 16th drill for a quarter inch NPT. And then they've got the counter bore for the quick connect, all right? So that's what that is. That Those are water lines in the rear clamp plate. And I'm going to guarantee you, if we look at another view, those go right underneath some big core pits to cool them off. Moving along, sheet 13, okay, um, basically uh, sprue bushing. Store-bought item, and uh, one thing you'll notice here is uh, a flat on the side. And that's very important because we have to index this thing right, so it just can't, uh, you can't put it in any way you want. So we're going to put a dowel pin in the, uh, uh, the A plate to index this uh, it's just a modification to a standard screw bushing, screw bushing, so it can't twist. It can't be inserted wrong because of the runner that's going to be cut in. You can't have the runner being twisted off 45 degrees, right? It's got to be straight. Again, it's got a standard, uh, he's got it right here. It's a DME um, B6603, R radius is a half inch, O is 530 seconds, and if we look at that closer, uh, that is 530 seconds here. And there's your half inch radius for that particular press all right so this is a store-bought item again this two inches is nominal depending on how the a plate comes out it's supposed to be uh, whatever it was two and three eighths two and seven eighths if it's a few thousands over or under that would be ground at assembly and again uh, that will be good that dimension is always good but this two inch which should probably be marked uh, fit at assembly okay because it's got to be flush with the b plate all right, and so if uh, the plate's a little big or a little small, this can't be sticking out too far, it can't be recessed, or you get a big hockey puck of material here, okay? So that's all that is. It's just a simple uh, sprue bushing, uh, probably about 50 or 60 bucks, I believe, back that we paid for these, uh, but that uh, is the part that gets all the plastic into the mold. Sheet number 14, got some details here for all the core pins that need to go into this thing. Uh, what's it say? Core pins one through five, and uh, these are the guys that are going to core out all those um, bosses that are going to put this part together and sonic weld it. Well, let's see. Let's take a look at this. We've got a lot going on here. Um, again, we got a weird thing there with the, some of these views because of the way it's interpolated. Unless that thing has a big angle on the head. Not sure about that. But um, what he's showing here is the draft, large detail. Uh, let's take a look at this. Remember I told you we had to do this? The only way to do that, to get a flat bottom, is to EDM all that. All right. So what we would do is make an electrode with the inside diameter and then cut these slots out and burn uh, an ED using an electrode to do all that work. That's a lot of work and that's all got draft on it. All right. So the part will release. Uh, you can see um, all the dimensions to make those slots happen. A lot of work just for some core pins all right and if you look down here you can see let's hopefully you can see there they are see the slots this has draft and these have draft so back to working with molds nothing is flat 
everything's got draft on it or the part won't come out. All right, so when it comes to the cavitation, of course the mold base itself, everything's uh, flat, parallel, and square, but once you get into anything that touches plastic, very rarely is it um, going to be uh, straight. And uh, that's why we all learn shop math and trig right away. Uh, lots of uh, quick calculations for uh, draft angles, all right? But those are the core pin drawings and uh, core pin K, let's see, PCS, PCS, I wonder if any of these were uh, made out of any special material. I don't think they were. Uh, sometimes we use a different bronze called Amcoloy for some core pins, depending on the uh, amount of money the customer wants to spend to make things cool off faster. But again, standard core pins that you would buy, all right, and alter. And uh, you don't make these pins from scratch. They, this, you buy them off the shelf. And let's see what's this curiosity. Uh, this is a 7 inch one. I think they came in 3, 6, maybe 9, and 12 and 20 inch length. So we would probably either run a 9 or 12 inch length. Uh, and then we cut that to about uh, on a cutoff wheel to about 7.7 uh, .7 and grind the rest off. And one of the things you do as a mold maker is you get really good at grinding pins down with your. Uh, uh, you make little uh, setups to grind the links and uh, of course the whirly jig to uh, spin them down to the draft on them. But uh, these are, uh, as you can see, some very busy core pins. And again, that's all for the sonic welding. Finally, we begin with the uh, end, I guess, with sheet number 15 and injector sleeves, one through five. And uh, let's see, quantity of four, quantity of two, quantity of two. Good design here. And again, these are just store bought right off the shelf. It probably says right here progressive uh, material custom. I'm not sure why that was custom. Uh, but uh, PCS, progressive, different sleeves here. And again, these are usually store bought right off the shelf. And uh, you don't have to do anything to these uh, um, diameters here. This is all taken care of at the factory. And he's got very precise dimensions on the length. But again, that would all come down to the stack up height of the mold and the length of the rails and all the stuff that uh, goes into, again, a mold maker's checklist, how to assemble a mold. And that's another video, okay? But uh, these are all, this should say, fit at assembly, fit at assembly, fit at assembly, fit at assembly. Because it, it, uh, once everything's ground up and comes out a little oversized or undersized, no big deal. But the mold maker has to sit down and take a minute and recalculate all these lengths. And they might change by, you know, the 15, 20 thousandths either way. No big deal. But these are going to control the length of the uh, boss in the, in, in the plastic part. So very important. But uh, again, uh, nice way to learn the trade is uh, grinding pins. Uh, if anybody's watching this has been a mold maker, we grind a lot of pins. So again, store bought items, cut them off a little long, surface grind them the length. Uh, we used a, as a tip, 98% of the time uh, I ground pins, they were uh, with the side of the wheel. You learn how to use a cup wheel and uh, very accurate uh, once you get used to using a cup wheel. Uh, you can't be standing, uh, these are fairly short, five, six inch pins up uh, in a V block and they get a little, uh, what do I want to say, a little vibration there. Uh, when you clamp them down sideways, no vibration and a cup wheel. So that is that. That is uh, the complete wrap-up of 15 sheets of uh, the nozzle mold. And as a special bonus, uh, we're going to take a look at the 3D rendering, uh, the surface models for the cavity and core plates. Uh, this is actually the cavity plate, all right? So uh, this is uh, what we would be sent to uh, actually machine from, all right? This is what our programmer would use was this to machine all this work from. If we had to extract areas for EDM, that's what he would use. Now, this is interesting because if we uh, go to uh, the rotation button, and we'll try to keep this in the screen, okay? Uh, we are recording now, okay? There's not a lot going on here. We're not showing a lot of detail on the front or back of the plate. All he's trying to do is show us what's going on here for the programmer to program all these areas and again the programmer would do his best to get in there with little cutters and uh, ball mills to cut all this detail. If I remember right I don't think we did a lot of EDM on this project but um, that's it that's what he would work from to get the uh, 
actual cavitation machined into the uh, A plate front half of the mold. Now, if we go to the uh, back half of the mold, again, uh, if we were to uh, zoom in on this a little bit, now we're starting to see some of the EDM work. That was definitely an EDM job there with these uh, gusset ribs. And uh, if we were to rotate that a little bit, uh, we should see a little bit more here, right? Looks like a saw cut right in there. And look at that. Uh, this is interesting here. All right, we've got a, a little bead going all the way around here. See that? And uh, that's a lot of fine cuts there. And there's no doubt in my mind that had to be EDM, I would think. But I don't have all the exact records for this mold. It depends how fast your spindle runs. But uh, that's a nice look at the core half of the mold, right? That's a standing steel. That's the ejector side. This is what the part is going to stick to uh, after it's uh, set in the mold. And that's why all the ejector pins are on this side. Now you'll notice that he doesn't show the leader pins, sprue bushing, and ejector pins or anything. This is much more for the uh, programmer to work from. So that is the uh, 3D surface model for the B plate. All right, so finally let's look at the uh, internals here. This was the original quote, and uh, what they originally wanted was a one uh, plus one family mold, nozzle right, nozzle left. Standard mold construction, uh, knockout pins, um, sleeves, subgates, P20 steel, and a number three finish, okay? So, uh, and they came back and said, no, let's move this to a two plus two family. Two nozzle rights, two nozzle lefts, and we ended up at 24.9. All right. Well, additions, mold design changes. I don't have all the notes here, but we ended up at uh, a little bit more than that, 31.9, I believe. But this is how I used to keep track of my labor. Now, Endeavor Mold, that was my second tool shop, I had about the eight guys, so I could just do this by hand, right? And every day I'd write down what these guys spent their time on, they'd fill out a time slip. And you can see uh, we have the time on uh, uh, CNC work, EDM work, grinding, it's all there. But here's the big news, okay? So this is interesting. Endeavor Mold Design, and these are my shipments for February. Um, the nozzle mold. And uh, I, was, I invoiced them eventually 31.9. And again, uh, they came back to me with design changes, I'm sure. And the price did get increased quite a bit. So uh, my total purchases on that mold were $12,300, and that would have been uh, all the steel, all the design work, injector pins, uh, sleeves, all that stuff, mold-based components. We had an actual total of 320 hours to complete that mold. So nice profit there, uh, $9,796, 31 percent, 30 almost 31 percent profit. Kaching, uh, we quoted at 44 an hour. We made 61. You know, as long as they're 51% of them are uh, right, you're good. Now, this is a little confusing here. It says labor rate, 1425. Well, that's the average labor rate uh, for my guys. Now, this is 20 years ago. I think my top rate guy back there was about 18. Had a lot of guys at uh, 14 and a couple guys at 10. So it all averaged out to 1425. If you did all the math here, I always talk about this thing called your burden rate. And your burden rate is what it costs to actually operate your shop. So you take that, uh, th that, that labor rate and you multiply it by your overhead. In my case, it was 2.15%. And uh, that brought us up to about uh, uh, 30 bucks an hour, 31 bucks an hour. So that's how that all works out. So, uh, but uh, that was a good one. So that's it from here, uh, the nozzle mold. Uh, we made some money on that one. Yay. And as my old boss used to tell me, as long as you get 51% of those quotes right, you'll probably make it. So um, what we need to do next is uh, teach us on a lesson at the Tool and Die Guy and uh, post a link where you can all jump on. And I'll do that underneath the video. It'll be a Zoom link. And I'm not going to go through all this again. You're gonna, you guys know all the sheets and all the numbers now. You can rewatch it. And uh, jump on with me and uh, I will answer your questions live. So uh, check out the link under this video, the toolanddieguy.com, a Zoom meeting, and uh, let's talk about mold making and uh, your questions and 
my best answers, at least on this particular project. I'm Phil Kerner, the Toll of Thy Guy. Thanks for joining me tonight.